Number 47. A football player punts the ball at a 45 degree angle. Without an effect from the wind, the ball would travel 60 meters horizontally. What is the initial speed of the ball? All right, so let's take a look at the picture. So we have a ball being punted at, a, at an angle of 45 degrees relative to the horizontal. The ball travels a range of 60 meters. And what we are tasked to do is to find the initial velocity. So we can use this lovely formula over here on the right-hand side that I just boxed, all right? That formula says that the range of x, okay, meaning the distance traveled in the x direction, will be equal to the initial velocity squared times the sine, okay, times the sine of two times the initial angle divided by the value of g, all right? So uh, by the way, this formula is only used for when the ball is released from the certain height it lands at, okay? So we have now, this is 60 meters, right? The initial velocity is what we're looking for, times the sine of now two times that initial angle of 45 degrees, all over 9.80. All right, so let's cross multiply. 60 times 9.8 works out to be 588. I need two sig figs here because that's what they, oh no, this is actually 0. 0.0. So three sig figs, so 588 is gonna be equal to the initial velocity squared times the sine of two times 45, right? So sine of 90 essentially, that's just one. So it's just the initial velocity squared. To get rid of the square, take the square root of both sides. Now remember that when you take the square root of anything, you always get a positive and negative answer. So in square root of 588 gives you a value of 200, uh, excuse me, 24.2, so 24.2, and that's in meters per second. Now, which value makes sense, the positive or negative? Well, um, in this particular case, since it's the resultant velocity, it's always gonna be positive, all right? You're not gonna have a negative resultant velocity unless it were in a pure x or y uh, plane, all right? So we're just gonna take the positive answer here. Let me just erase that little negative sign, and that will be the answer for the initial velocity. Great. So now, uh, this is the initial velocity, and now it asks us, so let's turn our attention to part B. So it says, when the ball is near its maximum height, well, near its maximum, let's, we, near when? Well, we're just going to say it's at its maximum height. It experiences a brief gust of wind that reduces its horizontal velocity by 1.5 meters per second. What's the distance now that it travels? All right, so basically they're telling us that something, some gust of wind happens right here, right, when it reaches its highest point. So what will now be the total displacement? So obviously it should be less, right? But what's important is we gotta break this problem up into basically two parts, all right? We wanna look at this as the first part to the left is part A, and then the second part will be part B, okay? So uh, first thing I can do, since I now know this initial velocity, right? I just found it over here. I can then find the components of that initial velocity, right? I can find the X component here, Okay, great, and then I'll call, let's say, VIX, and I can also solve for the initial component of Y. Right, so I'll call that simply VIY. All right, so um, first, why don't we calculate VIX because they're talking about horizontal velocity, so that's probably what's important. So remember that uh, in order to solve for this, the initial velocity in the X component is equal to the initial velocity result in vector multiplied by cosine of theta, assuming that, that the angle of theta is with respect to the x-axis, which it is. So we get the initial velocity in the x-direction being equal to 24.2 multiplied by cosine of 45. Okay, great. So the initial velocity in the x-direction now should be, simply plug it on in, so 24.2 times cosine of 45. So we get a value of 17.1. So this is 17.1 meters per second. Okay, great. Now that is um, that is the velocity initially uh, in the x direction, right? Now that will be the initial velocity only for though part A. Why? Well, remember again, there's no accelerations in the x direction, and therefore the velocity should have been constant, assuming there was no wind. But now what happens is that they told us that there is a gust of wind that happens at the top, and it reduces its horizontal velocity by by 1.5 meters per second. So therefore, I could say this, go back to the, go back to my answer over here, that the initial velocity, blah, 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 
the initial velocity in the X frame, okay, for part A is 17.1 meters per second, all right? And now the velocity, the velocity, whether it's initial or final or whatever, it's going to be average uh, because obviously the ball had to decelerate, so there should have been some time, but they didn't give us that information, right? So I could say now the, the velocity in the X direction for the frame of B, for part B of the problem, is equal to now 17.1 minus 1.50, Right, so that should be now equal to 17.1 minus 1.5, 15.6. So that is 15.6 meters per second. Okay, so that's great. Okay, wonderful. So now how do I figure, how do I now find the uh, total, what did it say? When I guess uh, What distance, right, so what distance does the ball travel? Okay, so remember now I need to solve for time. Right? I know the velocities. By the way, both of these are average velocities. Right? So really, the average velocity of part A is equal to 17.1 meters per second. And the uh, average velocity of part B is equal to 15.6 meters per second. Okay? And now, and uh, what distance does a bull travel horizontally? Okay. So now what I need to do is I need to figure out time. Right? I need to, I need to know time. So how do I find the time that the ball is in the air? Well, that has to deal with Y components, right? So in terms of Y components now, now I'm gonna be using the initial velocity in the Y direction, all right, to solve for my time because there's no other way to do it. So let's write down what we know. Here will be my initial frame of the problem, and here is now my final frame. By the way, I'm now not looking at it as A and B anymore, okay, I'm gonna leave them up, but now I'm shifting gears and I'm talking about now calculating time given the Y components, okay? So the initial velocity in the Y direction, right, is equal to the initial velocity resultant vector multiplied by sine of theta, assuming that that angle is relative to the X axis, which it is. So we're good. So that should be equal to then 20, 24.2 times the sine of 45. And we already know the value it should be the same as the x because it's a 45 degree angle. Let me just calculate it again, just to make sure I didn't make a mistake before. And it comes out to 17.1, so we're good. All right, so this is 17.1 17 meters, meters per second. Okay, great. What's the acceleration in the y frame? Right, negative 9.80. Why? Because it is a free fall problem, okay? The final velocity in the y direction, now here's the thing, we actually do know it, right? There's symmetry to the problem. So whatever the initial velocity of y was before will be the same as the final velocity in the y direction after, but in the opposite direction. So therefore, since the ball left and returned at the same height, I do know this final velocity. It would be negative 17.1 meters per second, all right? And uh, what's the other thing? Okay, displacement, right? What's the change in the y value of this problem? Well, it started it at the initial point and ended at the same height, so therefore it's zero, right? It didn't change any height. So now we can find our time, all right? So what formula uh, should we use here to find our time? We could probably choose any one, but what might be the best is easiest is number one, all right? So the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. So the final velocity was negative 17.1. The initial velocity was 17.1. And the acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.80 multiplied by t. So notice how we're going to subtract the 17.1 from both sides. Okay. So this should work out to be now 34.2. Right. Negative is equal to negative 9.80 times time. And look at that. All the signs work out. Negative 9.80 divided by uh, or divided out on both sides. So now the time value works out to be. So let me just plug that into the calculator. So we got, okay, so we got uh, 34.2 divided by 9.8, and it works out to be 3.49. So we got 3.49, and that is in terms, whoops, that is in terms of 3.49 seconds. Now that's the total time, right? That's the time from the initial state to the final state. But remember, when it reaches its maximum height here, which is halfway through the problem because it's symmetrical, uh, we have a change in velocity. So therefore, the time value in A 
will be half of the total, right? And the time value in B will also be half of that total. So basically what I can do is take 3.49 seconds and divide it by two. Okay, 3.49 seconds and divide it by two to find the time for each part A and part B. So 3.49 over two. So we get a value of 1.75, considering uh, rounding. 1.75 seconds, 1.75 seconds. Okay, good. Now I know the times for each the A and the B frame. So now let me utilize that information. Here's the A and here's now my velocity in the A frame and now I can find the displacement, right? By saying that the average velocity is equal to the change in, uh, excuse me, that the, the displacement divided by the time. So my average velocity, I could have put in the A frame and the A frame, right? Is the time in the A frame. So now the, sorry, let me erase that. So now the average velocity in the A-frame we calculated to be before 17.1. That's equal to the displacement in the A-frame, which we're trying to find, and the time, which was 1.75. We just found that. So simply do a cross multiplication here. So 17.1 times 1.75, you get a value of 29.9. So this is 29.9 meters. That's the distance in uh, the A-frame, or the A part. And now let's do for B. So the average velocity in part B will be equal to the displacement of part B over by the, uh, divided by the time of part B. So this now velocity changed, right? It was reduced by 1.5 meters, they said before. So now it's 15.6 is equal to X sub B over then the time, which was 1.75. So now my displacement in the second part of the problem, part, part B, should be 15.6 times 1.75. So we get 27.3. 27.3, that's in meters. Now, how do we find then the total distance? Obviously, we just add them up, right? So the total displacement here should be the displacement of part A plus the displa blah, 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 displacement of part B. So the total time here should be 29.9 plus 27.3, and that will equal 29.9 plus 27.3, 57.2. So it comes out to be 57.2 meters. That is the... Uh, total horizontal displacement. So if I had to draw it now, if I had to draw this little line here, it would it would go maybe to about there, right? It's a little shy of the 60. Okay, so that is 57.2 meters. All right. Notice how uh, the di the uh, displacement in part A is 29.9, right? That's basically 30. And if you doubled 30, right, assuming that there was no slowdown here, what would it be if you took 30 plus 30? It'd be 60. And what was the original horizontal displacement? It was 60. So everything sounds like it works out. Just a quick mental check. And um, make sure to also check that subscribe button. All right. That would be awesome. Thank you guys so much. And thank you for tuning in, spending some time with us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.